Okay. I will start from the. Uh, so, uh, um, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, organizers and Aubrey uh, for this invitation. It's certainly a pleasure to be here. And um, uh, I'm uh, glad to share with you our unpublished data. And because of that, I will ask you not to do any video recording or photography. I will try to convince you that if we talk about senescence in the aging animal and potentially in a human, there is one cell type that we need always to keep in mind, and this cell type is called levosinusoid endothelial cells. Now, senescence is becoming at the center of the aging uh, model in the last uh, couple of years, and because of that, I think it is ex extremely imperative to make sure that we're using proper genetic tools to label senescent cells, but also to eliminate senescent cells. So one of the pioneering uh, mouse models that has been uh, developed in the lab of Ivan Dursen uh, was using this uh, short version of the promoter of the P16, which is a 2.6 uh, KB sequence where they showed that removal of uh, cells that express this particular uh, construct allows you to extend healthy lifespan. However, one uh, can wonder that whether this such a short genomic sequence is in fact responding to the full repertoire of the P16 inducing factors, especially with aging, but also whether this short sequence actually responding in a tissue-specific manner. And clearly, the answer is probably no, because even if you look at the paper, you will see that this particular vector does not remove senescence or P16 expressing cells in all of the tissues. And for example, here is an example of two tissues, which is liver and a colon, where the, this, uh, uh, this uh, construct doesn't work at all. So the question arises whether there are senescent cell types, subtypes, that are present either in the liver or colon and any, any other tissue where this particular uh, mouse model doesn't work, and what is the contribution of these senescent subtypes to the longevity, and whether it would be beneficial to remove the senescent subtypes uh, from the animal in order to extend the lifespan. Now, if you look at another mouse model, in this case, uh, luciferase uh, knocking that has been generated in Nat Sharples's lab, uh, you see that uh, there is a very massive buildup of the, this uh, fl uh, fl uh, fluorescent signal, luminescent signal. And one thing that you notice is uh, that there, are, there is a significant difference in the expression of this luciferase between different mice. But also you will see that, that some of the mice express extremely high levels of luciferase. That makes you wonder whether you can actually use these mice or remove the senescent cells from these mice without killing the animal because of the, such a large abundance of the senescent cells. Now, so what we were thinking, we were thinking in the lab, and this project has been going on for about a decade, we were thinking what if we will create a system where we would be able to label or eliminate senescent cells very early in the mouse life when they start to appearing at very early age. So in this case, we will, wouldn't be creating too much damage because we're going to be removing only single cells here and there. But then the tissue itself should repair itself better because we're dealing with the younger animals compared to the older animals. So the idea is very simple. So we looked more carefully how we should generate our uh, knocking mouse models. We kept in mind that it's extremely complicated locus, so it has a lot of uh, responsive elements that will be responding to this P16 induction during the aging process. But most importantly, the entire locus is decorated by the polycom complex. So it's under very strong suppressive activity of the polycom. So when we start constructing these models, we were thinking that we need to preserve maximum genomic sequence as maximum as possible in order to have this construct in a really natural genomic environment. So the way we uh, decided to generate these knock-in models, we just decided to integrate our cassette into the very last exon, so in fact, after the last further exon. In this case, we're preserving the maximum of genomic sequence, but also what we've done, we introduced so-called self-cleaving peptides when we introduce our target, uh, reporter cassettes, and this will allow you transcribe this as a single transcript, but then subsequently when it's translated, it will produce different proteins. So we introduce several genes in this sequence. In this case, we're not even disrupting the P16 allele, and all of these proteins that are translated are separate proteins, single proteins. Now, for the purpose of this talk, I will focus only on Cree combinase. In this particular mouse, we introduce a constitutively active Cree. So it means that when the P16 is induced, 
three is becoming immediately active. So we don't need to introduce any activating compounds. So, so we're not relying on the efficiency on any of the any of activating compounds. Now, again, because we're using Cree, we're using genetic lineage tracing approach. In this case, P16 is driving, promoter is driving the expression of Cree. When the Cree is active, it will remove a stop cassette in, in front of the reporter or uh, deleter uh, uh, transgene. And then we can either label or eliminate senescent cells. Now, we're using so-called MTMG reporter. In this case, the cells are normally red, but when the recombination happens, they're becoming green. And to have a very definitive removal of the senescent cells, and you understand that it's very difficult to, in general, to eliminate senescent cells. They're quiescent, the, the DNA is condensed, so you really need to have a very decisive system to re remove it. We're using the DTA, or diphtoriotoxin suicidal system, that will def definitely will eliminate the cell. Now, first we checked how it looks like. So in this case, it's a dermal fibroblast of the P16 Cree mice with the OMTMG reporter that has been passaged to replicative senescent state. You can see that at very early passage, there is only a few positive cells. Once we start passaging, we see a buildup of these GFP green positive cells. And basically, and these numbers are consistent with what other people publish, uh, uh, specifically in Atropolis in his recent PNAS paper. Now, we can fact sort these green cells and look, stain them for SA beta gal, so majority of them SA beta gal positive, so in fact, these are cells are senescent cells. But the important question was, what is the level of threshold for our system in order to activate our reporter or to eliminate the senescent cells? And this is extremely important point because there are multiple factors that will activate P16 only in a transient fashion or very insignificantly, so we certainly don't want to label or eliminate these particular cells. So to look at the uh, level of the threshold, we looked at the level of P16 that is present when we passage these cells into replicative senescence. You can see that if we take the P16 MTMG cell, uh, cells and passage them, we see at uh, passage five about 20-fold increase of the mRNA. Now, if we have this system with the diphtoriotoxin, we see that there is a buildup of the mRNA, but this is, goes only to five-fold increase. Now, this five-fold increase is the our threshold level. And again, as I said, it's extremely important because we are not labeling or removing cells that are below this level of the activation of P16. And there are a variety of uh, factors that will contribute to transient or under-threshold level activation of P16 in cells. Again, it's not important for senescent cells because in senescent cells, we clearly have much higher level than five-fold increase. We can look at other genes. ARF is not really affected. And now uh, uh, dermal fibroblasts, we don't see much activation of P21 with, uh, with the replicative senescence. So it looks like we've built a system that is primarily labeling P16 high senescent cells. So we basically crossed, uh, get the, uh, our transgenic mice that express now DTA with the hope that this would be unmatched, the true potential of removal of senescent cells and to extend the lifespan based on this technology to the maximum. However, within one year of the experiment, my postdoctoral fellow, Loho, came to my office and said, we have a problem. And the problem was the following. So this is a one-year-old mice, and if we see, like, this is normal-looking one-year-old mice, and what we see with our mice where we continuously eliminate senescent cells, we see massive health deterioration by the one year of age. So this was extremely disappointing. However, of course, we set out to investigate what is the potential cause for this uh, a significant health deterioration in the mice where we're continuously removing these P16 high senescent cells. So first we looked at the necropsies of these mice to see whether we can see whether there are maybe some tissues missing or sub subtypes of tissues missing. Uh, looked throughout multiple tissues, don't see much difference. Looks like there is slight difference in the liver. Again, nothing conclusive. So we moved to the, our reporter mouse line, which is MTMG mouse line, to see what are the cells that we're labeling in our system and that the ones that we eliminate. So now if we look at the very young mouse, which is two, a two months old mouse, we see only very few cells here and there in different tissues, virtually no uh, GFP positive cells in the, in the tissue, which is consistent with what other people published. Now at one year of age, we already see somewhat a buildup in some of the tissues such as the lung and the heart to less extent in some other tissues. However, the, best, the, the most uh, abundant uh, tissue it turns out to be liver where we see already uh, some buildup in two months, old of my, uh, two months uh, old mice, more in one year uh, of age mice, and at two years, it's a massive buildup of the GFP positive cells. Now again, I put the human age here just to tell you that this starting very early, so even in this, that would be a comparison to the five-year-old human. Now, 
the uh, marker analysis turn, uh, turns out to reveal that these cells that we see here, green, they are not hepatocytes. These cells turns out to be uh, CD31 positive cells. This is uh, blood vasculature in the telial cells, or so-called levosinusoid in the telial cells in the liver. We see more than 95% overlap between the GFP positive signal and this CD31 positive marker. Now, we all know that uh, there is a buildup of P16 with aging and in liver inclusion. However, we didn't know that it's a CD31 comport compartment of the tissue that is contributing to the uh, upregulation of P16. So we looked at the CD31 positive and negative fraction in an independent approach just to confirm that, in fact, our P16 is coming from the CD31 positive compartment. In this case, we again purified using nanoparticles uh, CD31 positive and negative uh, uh, cells from the livers of two months old mice and two years old mice. And you can see that, in fact, the majority of the P16 comes from the CD31 positive compartment. So this is reconfirmation now. The P16 is accompanying with activation of senescence, so we wanted to look at the markers of senescence. In this case, we're purifying CD31 positive cells, so as I, as I said, they called liver sinusoid in the telial cells from mice of different age, and then we stain them with the say beta gal. You see that there is a very nice buildup of the say beta gal positivity, but what is striking then when you arrive to the time, two year time point, we see that the majority of the cells is already fully senescent. Now, it's not only say beta gal they positive, they have many other markers of uh, senescence that also would suggest that they are senescence. We see more uh, phosphor gamma H2AX uh, cells with the more phosphor gamma H2AX in two year old mice compared to the two months uh, old mice. We see less lamin B in two year old uh, CD31 positive fraction compared to two months. And we see more of the heterochromatic markers such as the K9 Me2 increase in uh, our CD31 positive two year old cells and uh, macro H2A. So all of this would be indicative that, in fact, these cells are fully senescent. Now, we can do more. So we can now take our one-year reporter mouse. We can purify GFP-positive fraction, GFP-negative fraction, compare them by RNA-seq, and look for the SASP, as uh, Judith presented. So we'll see, first of all, that there are P16, all P16 are now GFP-positive fraction. And again, if we look at different uh, ILs, CCLs, CXCLs, and other markers of these uh, senesce secretome, they all are regulated in these cells. So clearly, using multiple different approaches, we, would, we were able to show that these cells are senescent. Now, so what are those uh, levosinusoid and telial cells? And probably not many of you in this audience heard of these cells. However, this is, this is the very unique cell type. They have the highest endocytic activity in our organism, and they are absolutely essential for the clearance of the macromolecular waste from the bloodstream. So they are comprised up to 20% of the liver, so it's a significant mass. They, they are fenestrated in the telial, as you can see here, and these fenestrations or holes are absolutely essential for the blood content to go and start and being taken up by the hepatocytes. Now, as I said, they are extremely play extremely important functions, and there's some of them highlighted here. So they are responsible for the clearance of majority of viruses, majority of LPS with a speed that 150 times higher than what is required to re uh, induce the septic shock. They clear most of the oxidized LDL, and oxidized LDL is the one, is in fact, or mildly oxidized LDL, is in fact, that is responsible for atherosclerosis. It's also responsible for clearance of HDL and some of the small immunoglobulin complexes. So clearly, this is extremely important cell type cannot be simply removed without being replaced. So then we ask the question, what is happening in our diphtheria toxin mice? So first, we wanted to reconfirm that our diphtheria toxin mice are, in fact, working well by removing P16 positive cells. So in this case, it's a staining with the P16 antibody you see in the control mice. We see nice G, uh, uh, staining for the uh, P16. In our uh, diphtheria toxin mice, we see a nice reduction. We can quantify this significant reduction in the liver. We can look at this in different tissues. And again, we see diphtheria toxin is working in all the tissues. So we're clearly removing P16 positive cells. We know that P16-positive cells are CD31-positive cells, so the question now is, once we remove the P16-positive cells, whether we see the same number of CD31-positive cells that would be indicative that the replacement happened very successfully, or we see less CD31-positive cells, and what we see is, in fact, massive reduction in CD31-positive cells in these mice. So we see this in the liver, but in fact, if we looked at 
all of the tissues in the mouse you see, and this is one year old mouse, so you see that the trend is all of these tissues. We see a reduction in CD41 positive cells in some of the tissues reaching very, very significant values. So what happened that once we remove the senescent CD31 positive cells, these cells have not been replaced with the CD31 positive healthy neighbors. But the question was what they've been replaced with. So we looked in more details in the liver where the organ where the majority of these cells uh, were observed as using scanning electron microscopy. So this is the image of the uh, sinusoid where you can see this endothelial cells nicely line up sinusoids and you see this fenestration, it's a beautiful structure. And what we see in the diphtheria toxin mice, we see first of all that the liver density is significantly increased, but also you don't see any fenestration, anything going on. So, so the question was what was that? So we did the transmission electron microscopy. Again, in this case, you see the sinusoid cross-section. This is a magnified image. You see the beautiful endothelial cell. This is hepatocytes with the villi protruding into the space DC. And this is all empty, allows the exchange of the all nutrients, minerals, and toxins. And what we see in our diphtoriotoxin mice, the entire space DC is filled with the collagen. So it means that once we remove the cells, they, they did not activate the system of the replacement with the same cell type, but they activated another type of the tissue damage repair, specifically fibrosis. Now we can look at this with a different dye, in this case a picrocerous rat, you can see that in the liver, in our diphtoriotoxin mice, there is massive buildup of this uh, picrocerous rat positivity, suggesting that the collagen deposition, but again, if you look at other tissues, specifically lung and the heart, you see again the same thing. They continue to accumulate this fibrotic tissue. All right, so that was again, will it Overall, was disappointing, even though we believe that was a beautiful idea, that if we start very early by removing single cells and asking the system to replace the single cells. But again, we start to think maybe we made a mistake. Maybe, in general, it's not possible uh, for the system to see the single cells being removed to activate this massive regenerative response to replace the cells. What would happen if we take the old animal, remove a lot of senescent cells from the old animal, and then ask the system whether in this case, when there is a massive damage, whether the system will consider this by replacing these uh, cells with the CD31 positive non-senescent cells. So for that, we decided to make another mouse. In this case, we made a mouse that is tamoxifen-inducible, Cree. In this case, we can activate Cree by putting mice on a tamoxifen diet. So we allow these mice to age until one and a half years of age, and then we put them on tamoxifen diet, and first we check whether, we, in fact, we're also labeling CD31 positive cells in the liver. And in fact, we do label CD31 positive cells in the liver, as you can see, so tamoxifen model also is working. Now that we also can efficiently remove uh, P16 positive cells in this model, and this is diphtoriotoxin mouse, and this is staining for P16 in the liver, you see that there is a reduction. And this acute response, we also see that this results in the removal of CD31 positive cells. But again, this is acute experiments, two months of the tamoxifen diet. So we do expect that there will be a reduction in CD31 positive cells. Here again, we see with a massive drop here. Now, when we do this acutely with the, in the old animals, we know that there is a significant number of senescent cells in the endothelial system. And endothelial system plays important structural roles, so it's re responsible for the maintenance of the tissue blood barriers. So when we're removing so many CD31 positive cells, the question is what is happening with the leakages well, of, the, of the blood vessel? So this is very easy to test. So in this case, a mouse has been injected, control mouse has been injected with the dye, which is Evans blue. You can do it in the tail. You see the tail is blue, but all the organ organs are pinkish. So it means that the dye retained in the blood vasculature system never exited the tissue, so it never stained the tissues. Now, if we look at the now diphtoriotoxin mice, you can see that all the organs are now leaking this dye inside of the tissue. So telling us that in this acute experiment, when they start removing these senescent cells, there is a massive tissue damage in terms of, uh, that is done to the vasculature system. Now, we can quantify this, and you can see a different organs. You see that in our diphtoriotoxin mice, there is significant more tissue compared to the control mice. You can, again, quantify this. It's everywhere statistically significant. Now, so the uh, endothelial cells play extremely important structural role, but they also play extremely important functional role, as I told you, at least in the clearance of the LDL and oxidized LDL. So when we're removing so much of the uh, uh, CD31 positive cells, the question is what is happening with the level of LDL and ox 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 LDL in this uh, case, and we see that there is a significant increase in the level of LDL in the, in the serum of this mice and also a significant increase of the oxidized LDL in the serum of, the, of this mice. 
Now, oxidized LDL is extremely powerful oxidant. So we, we uh, asked the question whether this powerful oxidant, in fact, can induce senescence in the same CD31 positive cells. So we incubated for four hours only CD31 uh, positive cells obtained from one year old mice. Uh, with the control and oxidized LDL, and you can see that this four-hour exposure is sufficient to significantly activate senescence three days later in these this cells. So what does it tell us that the second we start removing massively these senescent cells, the level of oxidized LDL will go up, will activate senescence in the remaining pool of the uh, cells that have not been senescent, and if you continue this senolytic removal therapy, it will cripple the animal very fast by creating this positive feedback loop. Now, but the question is, again, this is acute experiment, what is happening one month later, whether these CD31 positive cells finally have been replaced with the CD31 positive cells, and the, and the answer is no, they still have been replaced with the fibrotic tissue. So the system was unable to repair itself by replacing uh, the CD31 positive senescent cells with the CD31 negative senescent cells, or CD31 positive non-senescent cells. Again, you can see the buildup of this fibrotic tissue in you know, all, all, all of the tissues that we've tested. Now, to conclude, it's a general, generally belief, or it hasn't been systematically addressed, but believed that senescence is starting randomly in different tissues. However, what I'm trying to tell you here that in fact we think that senescence is not starting randomly. There is a particular pockets of senescent cells that where we start, uh, that is induced with aging, and one of these tissues is in fact the liver, and this buildup of the liver is massive. There is no tissue in the mouse body that uh, becoming almost completely senescent when the mouse is becoming very old. Now, this has a lot of consequences for that. One of the important consequences, as we believe, is that once cells are going into terminal stages of senescence, one of the programs that they are activating, they actually activating the program of transcriptional suppression. Now, these organs are extremely important. This organ is extremely important, as I said, in the removal of the blood-borne macromolecular waste. So if there is an element of transcriptional suppression, and now the endocytic receptors that are responsible for removal that oxidized LDL, some cell debris, some HDLs are being done, regulated, that could have a huge impact on the uh, life of the animal. And in fact, I can speculate even further that if we reach the point when the majority of our liver sinusoid and cells are becoming senescent and we silence our endocytic receptors, this is the point when we die. That's why we think that targeting these particular cell compartments is extremely important in order to delay senescence. Now, we're clearly showing here that we cannot simply remove the cells because the system would not repair these cells. This damage will be repaired by fibrosis. However, we can use other approaches to, uh, to, to deal with the senescence in this particular cellular compartment. We can do short-term uh, approaches. In this case, we can delay senescence, and in this case, we can use already well-known drugs that, in fact, can also act on the senescence in this particular cellular compartment, such as rapamycin, resveratrol, quercetin. These are drugs that all will be delaying senescence in this compartment, and this will give you somewhat mild, low to mild extension of the uh, development senescence of the entire compartment and potential life extension. However, if we're talking about real long-term potential for the extending the lifespan, what I think we should be doing is finding the way of removing the cells. And again, if you uh, people in the audience have good synalytics give us to us, we would like to try whether they can actually remove. But subsequently, we need to find a way to replace the cells. So, so without replacement therapy, it would not be possible to deal with this problem. Again, this is extremely challenging task because, again, as I told you, the, the fibrosis immediately comes in and starts basically preventing you this efficient replacement process. However, another approach that we believe would, could be very uh, interesting to explore, and we're actually exploring this approach, is reprogramming, and we believe that if genetic reprogramming of this particular cell compartment could also have a very strong impact in the life expansion. Now, this cell compartment, and again, as I told you, it's the main cell compartment that we see in the mouse, is extreme, extremely easy druggable because it's directly in the bloodstream. So you can put whatever you want in the bloodstream. These cells have a lot of the endocytic receptors. They will take up your viruses loaded with the, whatever DNA you want to put. So you can, it's really easy druggable cell compartment. So if we'll manage to revert senescence of these cells by reprogramming and epigenetic reprogramming, I think that could have a very very strong positive impact on the lifespan. 
And I would like to thank uh, you uh, for your attention and thank the people who was involved in this project, this uh, joint collaboration between my lab and Lahoy in my lab and Nicole from uh, K. Wagner's lab. And thank you very much. Questions? Where are the microphones? Um, so, just just to be clear, that was a real whirlwind. Um, do you is your impression that the previous uh, ink attack approach was somehow not clearing the P31 positive cells? So, so as I mentioned, uh, this mouse is not working in the liver, so they probably just missed this senescent cell. It doesn't work in the liver at all. And what about all the senolytic drugs? Do you think they are somehow not hitting this particular cell type? So this we really need to look into more carefully. So I, I don't have the answer for this uh, for this question. So um, you, I guess you're talking about the cetinib the quercetin combination, yeah? Oh, so the quercetin on its own is going to be suppressing, uh, blocking uh, senescence, right? So, so it will be affecting the load of senescent cells by just blocking senescence rather than removing the senescent cells. So, so if you're going to be using, let's say, Betagal as a readout or any other readout, so you will see that it's going to be less, but I think it's going to be because of the uh, blocking senescence rather than removal. Right, no, 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 but please. The, the reason I'm asking the question is when you look at the desatinib plus quercetin or you look at Judy's molecules uh, or you look at fisetin, uh, you know, in, in none of those systems do you see these awful consequences of senolytic therapy. So are all these other approaches somehow not hitting this cell type? I, I don't think people uh, look very carefully at the fibrosis, specifically in the label with the senolytic drugs. I think, this, uh, I think this has to be added to the list of the things to check to make sure that you're not causing these kind of things when you're using the senolytic drug. Again, as Judy alluded, I think it's extremely important to find selective senolytic drugs and you need to know what type of senescent cells you want to target in order to, to have benefits. But again, I don't think it can be all senescent cells that you can clear from the animal because there are clearly senescent cells that have benefits. Andrew. Uh, uh, Dimitri, thank you. Brilliant model and very provocative and fantastic and interesting talk. I have two questions. <clears throat> One is, since these cells are responsible for a clearance of pro-inflammatory agents such as LPS, uh, this uh, trans transition which they undergo with age, does it affect their ability to uh, to bind LPS, and if, if yes, maybe this transition which you, phenotypic transition which you see, is responsible for much higher susceptibility of all organisms, old organisms to pro-inflammatory agents, because it's becoming much less efficiently cleared by liver. That's the conclusion, I think, yes. Uh, so in fact, what we see in the initial senescence response, there is a pulse of upregulation of the receptors. And this is because in this particular cellular compartment, this, and as, as, as I told you, this is a fenestrated endothelial, and they clear uh, a lot of these LDLs and HDLs together with hepatocytes. However, once we get older and mice get older, the fenestrations are closing, they're getting smaller. So we're losing the hepatocyte component in the clearance, and I think because of that, endothelial cells are starting to upregulate endocytic receptors in order to compensate for the lost functions of hepatocytes. And this is consequence, they start taking up more oxidized LDL by compensating of the loss function, but eventually it drives senescence in these cells but in, in subsequent transcriptional suppression. But initial pulse is upregulate. And the second question, liver is the organ which is prone to regeneration, one of the rare in mammals. If you do a resection of the liver and you have regeneration, uh, you can regenerate up to two-thirds of the liver. Uh, in mice, the newly regenerated tissue, does it have rejuvenated cells or they regenerate, keep being senescent? So excellent question. And the, um, so the, you get full regeneration of the uh, liver sinusoid compartment in the regener regenerated liver. In the mouse, the most efficient regeneration happens until the mouse is six months of age. I don't think people were able to do a liver, partial liver regeneration in mice that older than one year of age. So we're dealing with a situation when there is not much senescent cells going on, and the progeny for the, that comes and replaces the cells is still very debatable. So people think that it's really orchestrated process between the damage of the hepatocytes, recruitment of some blood uh, progenitors, and stuff like that. So, so it's clearly not clear what is the pro uh, 
precursor of the cells that replace and make the uh, new liver sinusoid and cells in the regenerated liver. But uh, with certain level of limitations, I think this could be an interesting experiment to do. So maybe I missed it. Uh, if you continue the uh, P16 clearance, what's the life expectancy of this? Mice? So we cannot do. We can. I cannot tell you about the uh, life expectancy because the mice are becoming morbid. So, so we, based on the regulations, we have to kill them. Yes. Yeah? So, so I can tell you that there is about 30% of mice that are becoming morbid. So, but uh, they may continue living for a long time. Or I don't know. Maybe there is some recovery. But I guess this, with this degree of liver fibrosis, I don't think it's happy life. Jerry. So uh, there are uh, compounds in. in trials to reduce liver fibrosis. Uh, you know, there's experimental models like carbon tetrachloride induced fibrosis. So the question that I have is if you clear the senescent cells and put these mice on uh, compounds that would reduce the fibrosis, do you think that would have any added benefit? So In other I words, think you may need the time. Right. For the so that would be important, but we need to put also the cells that are going to be patching the holes in this uh, in these mice, right? So, so we cannot just prevent fibrosis because in this case the the blood vessels will continue leaking, and so, so we will be creating even more damage. So if we have something that we know we're going to go to the site and patch the hole, of course we need to block fibrosis. Yes. Any other last yeah, question? So yeah. wonderful talk, thank you. So first you mentioned quercetin, but it's known to be senolytic, so do you think, why do you think it should have different effect? And secondly, perhaps a bit naive question, what if you add P53 as a target, not P16, what will be happening, do you think? So uh, I cannot comment on P53, we have not done any P53 suicidal driven system. Quercetin, as you know, has multiple activities, and one of the activities is CIRT activating activities, so on its own it can downregulate the expression of some of the galactosidases, such as alpha and beta galactosidases, that are responsible for the SA beta gal positivity, so it has just too many activities to also to comment that it's only senolytic or there is something else in this particular compound. But it does have activity that will delay senescence as seared activator activity. Thank you, Thank Dimitri. You.